Hi, this is Constance Towers, and welcome to TV Confidential. Tulliver, as you go through life, you will find that when there are two strikes against you, it'll make you nervous. Love, lol games. Dear Cheryl, may your life be like spaghetti, long and full of dough. Lynn Stewart. Tulliver, when you're old and drinking tea, burn your tongue and remember me. Lovely. Ed Robertson, along with their guests Bud Moss and Howard Storm. Bud's book, Hollywood, Sometimes the Reality is Better Than the Dream, is a thoroughly entertaining account of Bud's career in Hollywood, including his efforts on behalf of Rita Hayworth, Jack Valenti, Tom Bosley, John James, and Hunter Tylo. Larry King says that Bud's book provides a wonderful and unique look at a part of the golden age of Hollywood and Hollywood television and films that will never be repeated while the late Jack Valenti himself once described Bud Moss as a man who never gives up and is always moving forward. Hollywood, sometimes the reality is better than the dream is available through Amazon.com wherever books are sold online. Howard Storm's credits as a television director include episodes of such popular shows as Everybody Loves Raymond, Keenan and Kel, Daddy Dearest, Rhoda, Alf, Angie, Laverne and Shirley, and nearly 60 episodes of Mork and Mindy. Both Bud Moss and Howard Storm will be honored at the annual Beverly Hills Theater Guild Luncheon, which will take place on Sunday, March 17th at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills. The theme of this year's luncheon will be the Hollywood Renaissance, while the highlight of the program will be a tribute to the films and television series of Gary Marshall. Anson Williams, Danny Most, and Marion Rosso also scheduled to appear that afternoon. Proceeds from the luncheon will help the Beverly Hills Theater Guild fund their annual national playwriting competitions. For more information, call 310-765-1605 or go to Beverly Hills Theater Guild.com. Let's see, we talked about how you first met Gary Marshall. How did you first meet each other? Bud first and Howard. Oh. Well, when I did Laverne and Shirley, I met Gary. He took me to the set. He said, this is the director. You'll be nice to him. He's a very nice person. And uh, that'll be it. He's going to direct us. (laughs) And I was introduced to the cast by Gary. Although I did know Cindy, because when I was with the committee, which was an improvisation. In San Francisco. Yes. And we were down here for a couple of years at the Tiffany Theater, mm-hmm. which no longer exists. Uh, and I joined them here. And uh, and Cindy used to come all the time. So I knew Cindy and uh, Penny I was introduced to. And it was uh, they had great chemistry, the How- two of them. Howard Hesseman and Peter Bonners, I understand, were also part of the committee. Peter Bonners, Howard Hesseman, uh, Gary Goodrow. Carl Gottlieb, Ed Greenberg. It was just a, a, an amazing group of people. Yeah, I, I understand that when it came time to casting the new the, the CBS Bob Newhart show, Newhart specifically remembered watching Bonners perform with the committee. Uh, you remember that, and that's yeah. Well, Peter is a, Peter Bonners is a brilliant performer uh, and a wonderful director too. Bud, how did you and Howard first cross paths? Well, I certainly have known of Howard over the years, going back to the early days of, of Gary Marshall's three major segments, uh, television shows, Mark and Mindy and, and Laverne and Shirley and Happy Days. But it wasn't until recently when I was told that um, we were going to have a cocktail party in Beverly Hills at the home of the president of the uh, Beverly Hills Theater Guild, and there was Howard. I thought it was Paul Newman for a minute standing at the at the doorway there. And I said, uh, I've, I've got to meet this legendary uh, uh, writer, producer, comedy director, etc. And we had a lovely five or ten minutes talking. And uh, I was trying to figure out at that point, uh, along with Eva Marie Saint, how we were going to build a program. Because I usually get building above the title. And I know that Howard usually gets in special guest star Howard Storm. So we had this little conversation which went up in smoke, but all kidding aside, it was a treat to meet him, and we've had a, our first concept meeting last week on how the uh, program's going to be structured. And it should be a lovely afternoon in the park, as they say. Well, it, uh, my introduction to Bud was through my uh, barber, Manny Castillo. 
he cut both our hairs, uh, hair, and he he gave me the book. He had the book, mm -hmm. uh, Bud's book, and I was intrigued that a, a a young American guy from California would become a, a bullfighter. That was just amazing to me. So I I was looking forward to meeting him, and finally did. Could you imagine that at our barber shop? that we've both been going to for all these years, and we never met. And there was my dear Manny, who was my favorite barber, pitching my books to people. And uh, yeah. I think he even sold a couple, and I had to give him commission on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just serves as a reminder that Hollywood is a small town. Yeah. Too small. Yeah. Too small. On the line with us is legendary Hollywood talent manager Bud Moss and longtime television director Howard Storm. Bud Moss and Howard Storm will be among the honorees at the annual Beverly Hills Theater Guild Luncheon, which will take place Sunday, March 17th at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills. The theme of this year's luncheon will be the Hollywood Renaissance, while the highlight of the program will be a tribute to the films and television series of Gary Marshall. Proceeds from the luncheon will help the Beverly Hills Theater Guild fund their annual National Playwriting competitions. For more information, call 310-765-1605 or go to Beverly Hills Theater Guild dot com. Another common thread, you know, circling back to Gary Marshall, another common thread uh, for you both is is Jerry Paris. Yes. Jerry, <laughs> I'll tell you a quick funny thing. Jerry was so disappointed that he wasn't able to do Happy Days and Mark and Mindy, because he wanted to be the guy with uh, with Robin. He wanted to be directing Robin. Mm -hmm. So every time I saw him on a lot, he would say to me, you know, I directed him before you. <laughs> and i say, yeah, you did. You did. He was, it was very important to him. For those people, Ed, that were not aware of, of who Gary, uh, Jerry Paris was, uh, I go back to early days of The Untouchables, if mm -hmm. not before that, mm -hmm. when he was a very successful actor mm -hmm. in this town, yeah. long before he even thought of uh, hooking up with Marshall and becoming one of the top directors uh, on all of his shows. Great, great man. We, we lost him at a very early age, which was very uh, heartbreaking for all of his friends. Yeah. Yeah, and those who watch the Dick Van Dyke show know Jerry as uh, Jerry Helper, the Rob's, oh, right. Rob's next door neighbor. I understand that Jerry was a larger than life person in real life who spoke his mind unfiltered. Oh, yeah. not a question, not a question. Yeah, he did, and he always directed wearing a red sweater <laughs> so that you could spot him. <laughs> That was, that was his logo. That was his logo. Yeah. That was in case you didn't know who was directing the show you were watching. <laughs> and you went to the stage, you know, if you go to see it live, you always knew who the director was. It was clearly Jerry Paris in his red sweater. And the microphone. He had a microphone, and he would... <laughs> I love this. He would give notes to the actors with the microphone in his hand so the audience would hear it. <laughs> I think I think it was Van Johnson, a little trivia, Ed, that always wore red socks. Yes, and yes he did. It, it was uh, kind of his logo that uh, they'd say, see, I remember meeting uh, Van Johnson. He had a pair of red socks on all of his life. Yes, never wore any other color but red, red socks. And that was how he was recognized. Actually, people never saw his face. They just looked at his ankles. <laughs> Well, going back to Jerry Paris, I guess you can make an actor a director, but you can never take the actor out of the director. You know, once a performer, always a performer. That's, well that's said. true. Well said. Yes. I, agree. I remember my, my old boss, when he had a meeting one day, we were all sitting in his office with Jose Ferrer, who had won an Oscar for, for Cyrano. And uh, Joe was insistent that he be able to start directing and doing acting at the same time. And Marty Baum said, Joe, as brilliant an actor as you are, if you want to be a director, stay as a director and forget about acting. You cannot combine both of them together. 
and I can't remember how many more films Joe went on to do, but he uh, eventually stayed uh, stayed with his acting, if I remember correctly. Well, a, an example that tells you that Marty Baum was wrong is Woody Allen. Yep. He directs and, play, and, and works in all his movies. I guess it depends on who the individual person is, because it's not, I mean, Clint Eastwood is another example, like Woody Allen. Both of them know how to direct themselves while also staying perfect. Yeah, you're right. On the line with us is legendary Hollywood talent manager Bud Moss and longtime television director Howard Storm. Before I forget, I should ask you, what led you to become a director, Howard? What led me to? Yeah, what led you to become a director? I was doing stand-up. And I saw Woody's act, and his act, the material was brilliant, and my act was good. And so I realized that good wasn't enough. I didn't want to spend my life being a, an opening act for a singer, uh, because you have to have a particular a sense of yourself, you know? Mentality. Uh, yeah, because most of them will insist you come with them, do this, do that. So, you know, you don't, your life becomes there at their beck and call. And I'm not the personality that can handle that. So I realized at the time that Woody was just about to start directing his first film, Take the Money and Run. Mm -hmm. And we were managed by the same manager. So I spoke to my managers. That was Jack Rollins and Charlie Joffe. Mm -hmm. Great asked, combination. They were great managers, Howard. They were the best. They were the best. And I got a job on the film from day one to the rap party. And what it did for me was I, I knew what I wanted to do. I just stood next to Woody and listened to everybody giving him information about how to shoot this and to, uh, do that. And the uh, editor, Ralph Rosenblum, was standing next to him and would say to him, Woody, that's a great shot. Now give me an insert of his hand opening the car door, you know, and those kinds of things. And I just made notes. And I have two books, one of Take the Money and Run, the other of Bananas. And I have every shot, what lens was used, the distance, and how many people were in it. And that's how I learned cameras and directing. I'm going to go out on a limb, Howard. I'm going to guess, in, in addition to learning all the technical camera stuff and breaking down the script that, that, that you learn from working alongside and watching Woody Allen. I'm going to guess your experience as an actor helped you as a director because, at least with working with actors, because you know what it's like on the other side of the camera. Well, yes, without a doubt. And also, if you're an actor and you wind up directing, you have a love for actors. You have a great simpatico for them. You know the pain they go through. For me, anyway, I'm gentle as I can be with actors. I, I love actors. I just think they're very special people. Yeah, and it's it's about building trust. It's about getting the actor to trust that what you're asking them to do in this scene at that moment is going to help bring out the best in them as a performer and make the scene you need to shoot or the movie you're making or the episode you're directing as good as it could possibly be? What I usually do is gather the cast together the first time, and I tell them to do me a favor and take the word no out of their vocabulary. It has no place in a creative atmosphere. And I say, I will do the same. And this way, when I ask them to do something, they'll try it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Sometimes it will trigger something else. But as soon as you have, as someone says no, it just stops the flow. It's just, it's over. And uh, so I ask everybody not to, to use that word when I'm directing. Not only is that a good point, that's a good attitude to have in life, no, no matter what you do. Yes, yes, it is. Yes is so much nicer than no. <laughs> <laughs> On the line with us is legendary Hollywood talent manager Bud Moss and longtime television director Howard Storm. Bud Moss and Howard Storm will be among the honorees at the annual Beverly Hills 
Theater Guild Luncheon, which will take place Sunday, March 17th at the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills. The theme of this year's luncheon will be the Hollywood Renaissance, while the highlight of the program will be a tribute to the films and television series of Gary Marshall. Proceeds from the luncheon will help the Beverly Hills Theater Guild fund their annual National Playwriting Competitions. For more information, call 310-765-1605 or go to Beverly Hills Theater Guild. Dot com. Okay, we've been kind of teasing this. You know, we mentioned at the very beginning, Howard directed close to 60 episodes of Mork and Mindy, which means he worked with Robin Williams as he was becoming Robin Williams. Yes. And I know you've got your book coming out, so I don't want you to give up too much away, but can you briefly give our listeners an idea of what it was like for you to work with Robin Williams? It was amazing. I mean, he... He's beyond, he was beyond genius. Uh, I believe he was a savant because I don't, I can't imagine how someone his age would have all that information, you know. And it, it was a pleasure. He, he was very generous. I learned a trick because I was in a play with an actor named Gabe Dell, who was a wonderful actor. Yeah, one of the Barry Boys. That's right. Originally, the Dead End Kid. Mm-hmm. He he was TB which he had tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And Gabe, in the play, the director kept sitting on him and wouldn't let him go. Gabe, in a way, was like Robin. When you gave him a note, he took it ten times past the note, you know, and you'd have to peel back. And I learned watching it that they would sit on Gabe, and I knew it was wrong because I could see his frustration. So when I worked with Robin, I said to him, I'm going to let you go for a couple of days, but at some point I'm going to have to peel back and you're going to have to give me the play. And he agreed with that. You know, he said, yeah, Papa. Okay. (laughs) I had a beard the first season and he kind of, and it was all gray and he kind of thought of Hemingway. So that's where Papa came from. That's cool. Howard, wasn't Robin... I don't know where I heard this, but wasn't he at one time it started out like a street comic? He would stand yes. on the street and... Yes. Yeah, he did. He did mime. He would follow people in San Francisco. He'd follow right. I can remember that. And, and he'd get money from them. They'd give him a dollar and he would entertain them and do stuff and he would become the guy he was following because he was... I mean, he was beyond brilliant. There was, uh, I don't think there'll ever be another... To me, he was just a genius. I mean, just it's so hard to to define him because he could do anything. He was he was a brilliant comedian. He was a brilliant improviser. He was a brilliant actor, and he was a lovely human being. On the line with us is legendary Hollywood talent manager Bud Moss and longtime television director. Howard Storm. We will play the rest of our conversation with Bud and Howard at the end of the hour, among other things. We will ask Bud and Howard for their thoughts about the legacy of Gary Marshall and what made him a genius. That is coming up at the end of the hour. In the meantime, we'll take a quick time out, then we will welcome Jody Benson, the voice of the Little Mermaid, next on TV Confidential. Missed a show? We have more than 250 archived editions of TV Confidential available as digital downloads. For more information, go to shop.tvconfidential.net, shop.tvconfidential.net. Story Salon is Los Angeles' longest-running storytelling venue. We have live shows every Wednesday in Studio City, as well as solo shows, podcasts, CDs, and several books. Los Angeles Daily News calls Story Salon Gemstones of Narrative. Something new, funny, astonishing. Sunset Magazine says, Tales tall, tragic, and tantalizing. All of this makes Story Salon one of the most eclectic entertainment experiences available. You can learn more about us by going to our Facebook page or by visiting our website at www.storysalon.com. Uber is the mobile app that connects you with a driver for immediate transportation. Request a ride at the tap of a button and you have a driver curbside in minutes. You can choose to be driven in a black car, SUV, or you can choose UberX, the low-cost Uber 
for a ride in a hybrid or mid-range car. Payment is seamless and cashless. Build to your card on file with no need to tip. Enter the promo code TV Confidential after you download the app to receive a free first ride up to $20. For more information, go to get.uber.com forward slash go forward slash TV Confidential. If you've listened to TV Confidential and like what you've heard, please consider supporting our efforts by becoming a patron of our show through Patreon. It's easy to do and costs as little as a dollar a month. For more information, go to patreon.com forward slash TV Confidential or click the Patreon button on the homepage at tvconfidential.net. Ed Robertson, author friend Donna Allen Figueroa, who I understand has a new book out. Yes, it's entitled Fall Again Beginnings. It's the first part of a four-part contemporary romantic series uh, set against the background of working actors. Something that you know a, little, a thing or two well, about. Well, you write what you know, and I have been working in the business for several years. It is not necessarily autobiographical, but it's based on... Sure, many of the experiences that the actors in my book have, many have happened to me, many have happened to friends of mine. It's not, if you're looking for Valley of the Dolls, it's not, it's grounded in reality. It is grounded in reality, and it's the first in a series. Yes. Called the Fall Again series. Fall Again. Which is available as a paperback as well as an ebook and in Kindle. But fallagainseries.com.